thank you everyone who's watching for coming to our live stream event today. COVID-19 and cancer immunotherapy research, how science from the front lines of amino oncology is helping inform strategies to treat and prevent COVID-19. You wouldn't think maybe on a first um, thought that cutting edge cancer research would have a lot to do with the infectious pandemic that's changed all of our lives. Uh, but maybe when you think about it a little more deeply, it starts to make sense. The cutting edge of cancer research has come um, over the past 10 years from understanding um, immunology and understanding how the immune system can be harnessed to fight cancer. And that means that we're facing some of the same problems as we try to understand how the immune system reacts to this virus. We're brought here together by the Cancer Research Institute which is the world's first nonprofit organization dedicated to funding cancer immunology research. Um, its goal is to unlock the full potential of our immune system to treat and ultimately cure all forms of cancer. Uh, established in 1953, the CRI has invested 420 million in more than 3,300 3, scientists worldwide. Um, and we have a truly august panel here. Um, uh, Carl H. June, uh, to this audience, probably needs no introduction. He's the director of the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies at the Perlman School of Medicine and one of the key researchers in setting off uh, this immunotherapy revolution, particularly when it comes to cancer cell therapy, CAR T therapy, using the body's own white blood cells, harnessing them against blood cancers and other cancers. He is um, a member of the CRI Scientific Advisory Council, a member of the CRI Anna Maria Kellen Clinical Accelerator Clinical and Scientific Advisory Committee, and the awardee of both the 2012 CRI William B. Coley Award and the 2012 ACR CRI Lloyd J. Old Award. John Wary is the director of the Institute for Immunology at the University of Pennsylvania and the Associate Director of the CRI Advisory Council of the CRI Anna Maria Kellen Clinical, et cetera, uh, their Clinical and Scientific Advisory Committee, and the winner of the 2016 CRI Fred Alt Award. John's work has focused on T cell exhaustion, how the white blood cells that are used in Carl's work can, be, can get tired and start to stop working. And Miriam Murad, is uh, again, another CRI award winner, the um, winner of the William B. Coley Award in 2018, and is the Mount Sinai Endowed Professor in Cancer Immuno Immunology and the Director of the Precision Immunology Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, she co-leads the Cancer Immunology Pro Program at the Mount Sinai Tisch Center, and her laboratory has made seminal discoveries in understanding how the regulation of dendritic cells and macrophages are changed in cancer and immunotherapy diseases. Uh, we're all very eager to hear what you guys have learned in this pandemic so far and how your work in cancer is intersecting with, um, with understanding how SARS-CoV-2 affects the body. But I wanted to start with Carl and with something a little more personal because you, you contracted COVID-19, Carl. Um, tell us a bit about that. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, I think all of us, the panelists here, have a lot of frequent flyer miles. And it's turned out that airplanes are probably, the, probably one of the most efficient ways to cause uh, super spreading events. Um, and uh, John Weary and I went on a, a retreat uh, in the second week of March on private airplanes so that we would not be, uh, um, have at least less likely to be uh, exposed. And um, I got quite ill with a viral illness the day we returned. Um, and I'm not sure where I, you know, we had no contract testing then, this was March 12th. We had no viral assays in place at the University of Pennsylvania at that point. It was really early days in the uh, pandemic. Um, and because I did not require oxygen, I was not and did not require uh, hospitalization. Um, I just stayed at home isolating. And um, so um, uh, it, 
I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm fine now. Um, but uh, yeah, it certainly has caused a change in my whole professional and personal lifestyle. It's the first time I've gone four months now without being on an airplane since I can remember. And I think that's probably true for all of us on this panel and, and, and probably many in the audience. Uh, so our lives have been both professionally and personally changed in, in so many ways now um, uh, in, in, in just the last four or five months now. It must have been really striking to you. I mean, it became clear really while you were sick that the immune system um, getting overly amped up was one of the main problems in this disease that that acute respiratory distress syndrome was happening kind of for the same reasons that you see side effects in CAR-T. Um, I mean, how have you been thinking about that, you know, since, since we started to see this virus? Yeah, it's complex and I think we'll all spend quite a bit of time discussing this. Um, I mean, when I first came out of my postdoc, we had the very first beginnings of HIV epidemic and and uh and even then we found out that like when for instance antiretrovirals were started we had some people who had overimmune reactions they would have viral uh, ophthalmologic complications and so you know immune activation issues and it's been known for many years that in certain viral infections that inflammation contributes to the pathology and, and in fact john and miriam study that so um, and I became really interested in this in 2012 when we had uh, Emily Whitehead, our first pediatric patient, get CAR T cell therapies. And, um, you know, almost always as an oncologist, when you see someone with a fever, if they're a leukemic patient, it's because of a usually bacterial fungal infection. And she had fevers to 106 degrees for uh, three days after we treated her. And, um, and, and surprisingly, all the cultures were negative, and it turned out that she had um, probably some of the highest cytokine values ever recorded uh, and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and they were sort of the classic IL-1, IL-6 pathway cytokines. Um, and on biopsy of her bone marrow, we found uh, um, hallmarks of what's called uh, macrophage activation syndrome, or HLH. Um, and um, meaning macrophages were actually engulfing red cells and tumor cells, um, in addition to many CAR T cells. And um, um, we found she did not respond to high dose steroids or fever or to TNF blockade, because we tried those. Mm -hmm. Then we gave a single dose of, um, you know, a rheumatologic drug, tocilizumab, which blocks mm -hmm. IL 6 signaling. And she almost within eight hours, depravast and, and recovered from multi-organ failure. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, that's actually a contrast because so far we just got some news that the steroids do seem to have some effect in um, SARS-CoV-2 ARDS, but uh, the, the uh, tocilizumab and uh, sarimumab uh, results have been more mixed. John, it, we... Tell us a bit about what you think that we can learn about the COVID-19 immune response from what we've learned in, in cancer research. From studying these cells as cancer weapons, how can we figure out how to, how to not have them be weapons for this virus? Yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I think, you know, as cancer researchers, one of the things that we bring to the table um, to, to this challenge is the real need in cancer to understand a lot of nuances, a lot of details about the immune system, because in some ways, cancer immunotherapists are fortunate to have many, many drugs at our disposal, and we have to try to match those different kinds of drugs to the patient, the immune system, and the type of cancer where they're gonna respond the most. So over the past uh, you know, 10 years, really, the cancer immunotherapy field has built an ability to profile the immune system in exquisite detail to try to match therapies to the right kind of patient. And so applying that in COVID-19 um, gives us an opportunity to understand which patients are suffering from this sort of hyper-inflammatory state, uh, which patients may have failed to make an appropriate immune response and actually need more than immune suppression, they actually need antivirals and maybe immune activation, and really apply drugs and therapies to patients that might benefit the most. 
So the, the reports that we're hearing um, almost daily now of you know partial effects, or maybe there's a hint of an effect of a steroid or tocilizumab is or is not as promising as, as we might have thought previously, might actually reflect heterogeneity of disease. And that is there may be subtypes of patients that will respond very well to one of these therapies. But when you treat all hospitalized patients the same way, we may miss an opportunity to tailor a therapy to patients who will benefit the most. Miriam, you've gotten to try to, to put that heterogen, putting heterogeneity to practice, um, into practice in a place where we really needed it uh, here in New York. What have you learned from, you know, tell us a bit about the experience at, at Sinai. Oh, first, I want to echo what John did is that we, uh, the cancer immunology group, in fact, were quite prepared at uh, really facing the heterogeneity that, that we are encountering. Because we think about heterogeneity all the time, right? There is only a subset of cancer patients that are responding quite significantly to a checkpoint blockade, for example. And many of us have been uh, really trying to understand why patients respond and, and, do, and, and why some do not. So we never treat patients as a homogeneous mass. Right, and, and this is exactly the thought that we had when we started to see these patients is clearly COVID-19 was a very heterogeneous disease, right? 80% of the infected patients, infected adults will develop only a moderate disease or asymptomatic disease and only the 20% of infected patients uh, require hospitalization. And even among the hospitalized patients, uh, the majority are discharged after three to four days uh, and the rest will end up developing a severe disease and sometimes severe disease with end organ damage and, and, and that can lead to death. So we knew that, you know, based on the literature and what we wanted to know is how can we really predict and prevent this pathogenic inflammation because all these patients with severe disease clearly had this hyperinflammatory response. So really what we, you know, I want to just hear again uh, uh, really underlined the enormous uh, contribution of Carl's work uh, to, to this field. So Carl, you know, had told us that, in fact, if you can treat early with this IL-6 blockade, you may potentially prevent the cytokine release syndrome that is induced upon CAR T-cell therapy. So we were tasked by, an onco by you know, our oncology team, a clinical team, to develop a rapid test to, uh, uh, to uh, predict pathogenic inflammation. And we had done that, way, but we had man uh, uh, maintained it in, in the research setting, but they were still using it to, in fact, survey their patients. And the, what was very important to them is to have a fast turnaround result so that these results could be actionable. So the first things we did is we said, well, what we are going to do is use this fast turnover uh, uh, cytokine test and bring it to the clinic. And we were able to do that because we had built, thanks to funding, mostly from the Cancer Immunology uh, Agency, including the CRI that had funded us over the years to really build this immune monitoring platform. So we had built this research assay, but now we were able to transfer this assay to the clinical laboratory. And this assay was then in fact, prescribed through EPIC. So it means that the clinician started to prescribe it. And suddenly we were able to measure inflammatory cytokine in the whole group of, of, of patients. And we saw this heterogeneity. We saw that some patients had elevated inflammatory cytokine and some patients didn't. And, uh, and, and we are now using this data to really understand the pathophysiology of this disease. And we hope to use it also to guide therapy uh, and, 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 and potentially to identify uh, rational-based uh, treatment. So um, just a note from the, uh, from the questions, someone asked what heterogeneity meant, which it means in this case that everybody's different, that all these people's immune responses are different. Um, and also yeah. that's what's made studying drugs here uh, very difficult, maybe much more so than in a lot of other infectious diseases, because we do have people who get, you have people who are asymptomatic, you have people who get sick as Carl did, and then you have people who are like the people that that are ending up in Mount Sinai and, and getting Miriam's assay and, and can get very sick indeed. Um, what what strikes you, Carl and John, about, about hearing about that Mount Sinai experience and about hearing about being able to strike of uh, being able to to use these immune profiling uh technologies in 
COVID-19 quickly and hit the ground running? Um, you know, clearly, I mean, John's work and others now show, I mean, how much our individual immune response varies to the same pathogen. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's, so there's many host variables that we don't understand all yet and they're being studied. Um, and, um, what we don't yet know is, I mean, it's not surprising if you treat with the same drug and then it, that you're gonna have sometimes disappointing result, results or where they work if, if, if you have this heterogeneity. So having within cancer, I think it's leading there where we have personalized therapies, you know, based on tissue diagnosis. Is it a quote hot tumor or is it not? And, and the nature of that infiltration right now we, we don't have that in, in these viral diseases. They all get the same treatments. We do adjust HIV antiretrovirals based on you know, viral mutations and so on. But it, and, and we've always done for bacterial um, therapies, we, we look at bacterial sensitivities, the MIC, and, and adjust bacterial therapy. But you know, for, for you know, influenza, we've never done that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is where we need to go because some people need anti-inflammatory, and as John just said, others need basically their immune system to be jacked into action. Mm -hmm. John, talk a little bit more about the differences there. I mean, between the person who needs the immune system turned up to fight the virus and the person who needs the immune system turned off because it's, it's killing them, right? Like, talk about the different states. Give, give people a little bit of a, an overview. Yeah, it's, it's been very interesting. And in many ways, we've been following the lead of Mount Sinai, um, I, you know, partly because they were hit so hard and had so many patients, but also because of the work uh, that Mary and her team have done. Uh, and, and what we've done on our end is really try to understand, you know, once the immune system uh, does get started and we have so-called adaptive immunity responding to the virus, T and B cells are critical. In almost every viral infection, you need T cells, you need B cells, B cells make antibody. And so in looking at our hospitalized patients, what we've realized is that there are three different, broadly speaking, three different categories of the way patients respond. In one case, they have T cells, a certain subtype of T cells, that's responding very aggressively. And it's responding in a way that really isn't terribly well balanced. The other parts of the immune system don't seem to be playing as much of a role. That subgroup of patients really has the, the most prevalent clinical measures of inflammation and clinical measures of disease. A second group of patients seems to have a more balanced immune response, but yet they're still in the hospital. And the way they're presenting clinically is a little bit different. And then there's a third group of patients, maybe 10 to 15% that don't seem to be mounting an adaptive immune response. And these are the patients that really have, you know, some different problem with their underlying immune state. Now, the interesting thing is all three groups of patients are getting sick. And so what we're seeing from the clinical presentation is that the way that they get sick and get severe disease may differ. So we're seeing a lot of the coagulation events or the vascular pathology is really occurring in one subgroup of patients, whereas the other two subgroups- Which patients, subgroup? They're, they're occurring more often in the patients that actually have the hyperactive C4 mm -hmm. T cell response with perhaps less balance in the other arms of the immune system. Uh, whereas the other two groups of patients are experiencing different kinds of pathologies. Now, the interesting part of this is all of these patients or almost all of these patients that end up being hospitalized come to our front door with other problems. In other words, this is a patient group that has a lot of underlying medical problems. Almost all the patients that we see at Penn have underlying cardiovascular disease of one form or another. There's a lot of diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease, and other things that uh, each of them can be amplified or triggered to be more severely disease causing in the context of SARS-CoV-2 infection and the way the immune system responds. So what we've learned in doing this immune profiling is that the immune system is just one piece of the puzzle. And we have to link that to other aspects of the patient's background, overall health, but we think about it as really part of immune health. The immune system is surveying all of these diseases and it's not responding to SARS-CoV-2 in isolation. It's responding to SARS-CoV-2 in the context of also managing vascular disease or underlying diabetes. And so the things actually contribute to each other in amplifying the way the disease presents clinically. Miriam, what does it mean to put this kind of knowledge into practice right now? I mean, this is obviously a, I don't think I've ever seen a case where 
really it feels like if something's out in a press release, people will use it. So, I mean, how does this actually impact clinical management uh, of these patients? So, um, well, first, uh, I think I try to say that it has been an unprecedented uh, you know, time, right, uh, where a researcher for the first time, you know, researchers like to brainstorm, we think about idea for months before we do experiments, you know, and here suddenly what we had, it, we had to go on the front line together with the clinicians because they were saying, well, you know, we need your help. And um, and it was an extraordinary uh, uh, time, but, 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 but this is not how we work really, you know, usually uh, this is not what, how we work. So what we had to do is really use prior knowledge. And this is where I, I I think I insist, you know, I think there are some of uh, uh, the CRI donors here and I just commend, you know, what you've done for CRI because somehow this prior knowledge was built because uh, of, you know, the, the capacity to fund our research. So we had this prior knowledge that we wanted to mobilize and, um, uh, but then we had to learn about this new disease also. And, uh, and, and the first thing that I think is, it's important to realize is that we had to build these collection of, of samples in the middle of a pandemic uh, while you know the clinical care teams were trying to also uh, take care of these patients we were on the way often right so we had to say well can we have extra tubes for this and extra tube for that and how do we really collect thousands of patients you know at some point we had hospitalized 7,000 patients between February 27 and June 5th <laughs> At some point in our hospital, we had 2,000 patients. I, our hospital became a COVID hospital. We had stopped all the elective surgery. It was really quite bleak, you know. And There's nothing uh, else anywhere in the city is what I've heard from everyone. Well, we were the epicenter of the epicenter. I right. mean, definitely, we were hit. For reason, we are a big health system. We have five hospitals, and um, and somehow we were hit more than others. So, and 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 here we were. We we, we had this immune monitoring platform funded by all, you know, uh, mostly by cancer immunology. I have to say, and, and and other agencies. And and we said, well, you know, we potentially have the tools to understand this disease and how we can mobilize it. And I have to say, I made several mistakes. So the first thing we did is we mobilized, you know, the the scientists across campus. We mobilized them all, you know, so that they contributed to this collection effort. We were able Able to put some assay in EPIC, which means that clinicians were able to, to prescribe, you know, the, some of these research assay. Others, we had to send, you know, scientists on the clinical floor to collect these blood samples and bring them back to the lab. You know, we had to do that where scientists are not used to go on the, you know, on clinical floor and they could have been infected and these were students, uh, you know, the medical students were sent home, but the MD-PhD students and the PhD students were the runners. They were bringing samples, you know, to the nurses and bring it back uh, to be processed here at our in our immune monitoring platform and in real life we were analyzing this data, talking to many colleagues. I remember talking to John about some of the data and some of the assays that we would be doing, talking to my colleague in Italy, Alberto Montovani, and others, my colleague in, 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 in China, trying to learn as much as possible. And once a week, we will meet with clinicians to report back on what we've learned and then potentially advice. And I know we have these clinicians saying, well, should I use BTK inhibitors? We were like, uh, yes, uh, you know, I think loose out would like it. And I mean, this is what we had to do. Right. And, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, but it was an extraordinary time, I think, of, uh, of collaboration. You know, I've never talked to so many uh, clinicians at Sanai in my entire, I mean, in my entire stay here, which has been 15 years, uh, and, and an incredible time of solidarity across, uh, uh, across the world. So um, some amazing questions coming in uh, from the audience. So I want to start asking some of them. Um, and one of them is many cancer patients will know. One of them is that there are, uh, um, are there indications that cancer patients currently receiving immunotherapy are more resistant to COVID-19 than patients receiving chemotherapy or other or no treatment? Do we know anything about what the cancer drugs we do do to people's immune systems and to their end to COVID-19? Want to take that? We discussed this. Carl, you want to take this question? Well, I, I think it, you. I have to resist making any kind of blanket statements. It, it mm -hmm. clearly depends on the type of therapy. You know, whether it's right. cytotoxic chemotherapy, whether they're a bone marrow transplant patient who are on immunosuppressives for graft versus host disease, 
and whether um, or they're getting checkpoint therapies. And and um, so, uh, you know, we we do know that um, I mean, so it varies depending on what category you're on in that thing. Right. So um, if you have lung damage, for instance, some chemotherapies that are given cause pulmonary damage. Right. And, and so we know that that is a comorbidity that can, you know, lead to then worse outcome if they get uh, COVID to have previous damage from, for instance, bleomycin. So, so it, it depends exactly on the therapy you're on. And I think, um, uh, you know, how much organ reserve, I think John and Miriam could address the issue like on checkpoint therapies there, and there's controversies on whether checkpoint therapy change your outcome and I'll let them address that. Yeah, I think, I think particularly in checkpoint therapies, John and Miriam, what do, do we have any idea what they mean in terms of interacting with this virus? Maybe I'll start. Miriam probably has more, more numbers at Mount Sinai than we have at Penn, but, but looking at the data in the literature, it, it's not clear cut. There are some hints that maybe uh, in lung cancer, PD-1 blockade may make things worse, but other data say that that's just an effect of having lung cancer and, and uh, lack of organ reserve, as Carl points out. Um, <clears throat> certainly not black and white, um, and there's a little bit of data on each side. Um, so I think the jury's still out. I, I think what the take-home message is, is that cancer patients shouldn't stop getting cancer treatment. It's not obviously making things worse, um, and there may be hints of data out there um, here and there, uh, anecdotal reports of perhaps benefits in individual patients, but I think the jury's still out. Certainly at Penn, we've seen individual patients uh, with cancer but the incidence of our hospitalized COVID patients um, is not increased in the cancer population. If anything, it may be a, a little bit reduced in the cancer population compared to other populations. Marion, you may have more numbers in Mount Sinai. Yeah. No, this is, this is the numbers we're seeing. So it's possible that the cancer patients, you know, had a different behavior and protected themselves more uh, mm -hmm. because we don't see them overrepresented in our hospitalized uh, patients. But there are some data on patients on immunotherapy, not immunotherapy for cancer, but immunotherapy for inflammatory diseases. And uh, some data that are coming up quite clearly at Mount Sinai, you know, Mount Sinai has a very strong inflammatory bowel disease uh, uh, population. So patients that have inflammatory disease and require for example, treatment with anti-TNF blockade. And what we are seeing is that these patients have really uh, are underrepresented in among the IBD patients that develop severe COVID-19 disease, suggesting that potentially TNF, which is one of the inflammatory molecules that we think could contribute to uh, hyperinflammation and pathogenesis, uh, is indeed contributing to pathogenesis because when the patients were on in, uh, TNF blockade, they seem to have done better. And this is a big registry now on thousands of patients on TNF blockade. And it's quite encouraging because it suggests that, well, it could potentially lead to uh, uh, treatment and novel therapy. But I definitely would be looking at that very seriously here. So um, I'm curious for all of you, um, we had a big result uh, recently with, uh, from the recovery trial with dexamethasone. <laughs> and it's obviously very exciting to hear that a treatment actually helped in ARDS and apparently helped by being an immune modulator. Um, I'm curious, kind of a two-part question. Were you surprised that a steroid had such a robust effect in that trial? And then we only have really the top line sentence, right? We know the hazard ratios and it's a table. So what do we want to know about that? now that we've heard that there's this big result that there was an immune modulating agent that had an effect. What do we need to know about that, both to put it into practice and scientifically to understand that? Well, I'll start off. I, um, I was astonished actually that that had happened. I mean, I think our in infectious disease community and our intensivists in our ICU, mm -hmm. after 30 years have been doing trials with corticosteroids and um, and never have seen a trial that was really positive or a trial that was confirmed subsequently. So they've looked at ARDS from bacteria, bacteria from traumatic injuries to the lungs. And, and many trials have tried TNF inhibitors. There are, there are biotechs you probably know that have come and gone because the trials failed. Um, and, and so I think um, 
first of all, this needs to be in a peer-reviewed publication. Um, you know, we, we have to be cautious, but our infectious disease specialists at Penn are going to put this into standard of practice from what I understood on a call today, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm really surprised at how fast they are and will to rapidly adopt that. Um, and, and so I don't know why this trial seems to be positive and so many others, including previous trials of coronaviruses with MERS and SARS, mm -hmm. this wasn't seen. So it, yeah, I mean, there was a Lancet publication in ARDS from other viruses and that showed a benefit, but it was, you know, it was like a 15% benefit, not a 30% benefit. Yeah. And other trials have actually shown, um, you know, adverse events. Right. And later, as you know, either poor viral immunity or uh, uh, more uh, uh, secondary infections, opportunistic. And so my bet is they may have just threaded the needle perfectly with a low dose at the right time in the infection. Mm -hmm. I mean, assuming this can be confirmed, it's just very surprising to me. What do you think, Mary? Well, first, I, I would like to see the data, you know, so I think we are going to redo the same, you know, error than with chloroquine or, uh, you know, we have to look at the data, right? So right. we don't know what group benefited. Again, we were talking about patients' heterogeneity. It seemed that the patients that were most critical benefited. So before we put something into practice, we need to look at the data. So I'm really, uh, uh, you know, quite sad about it, that, that somehow, you know, there is a pattern during this pandemic. I don't know everyone, I, I'm, I understand that everyone is anxious, but, you know, we can be harmful to the patients. Now, I have to say this morning, what I what we did is we looked at cytokines. So what we, as, you know, I was talking about this cytokine measurement, and we measured the cytokine level, which are a measurement of, inflam of inflammation during disease course. And we've looked at uh, the, uh, in fact, the evolution of the cytokine level in different, in response to different treatment. And uh, we always treated steroid, you know, as a group. And then okay, this is off the press, right? And I'm going to do the same thing at this, you know, this is really just data. I'm, I'm just talking to you guys, right? And mm -hmm. it seems in, indeed when you look at, at uh, total steroid that the inflammation, inflammatory cytokine are reduced, but among the steroid, dexamethasone had the strongest effect which I didn't realize, but when we look at dexamethasone versus methylprednisone, dexamethasone had the strongest effect. So whether in some group of patients that were, you know, that this inflammation was really driven pathogenesis, those patients benefited, uh, uh, and, and those patients, you know, the, the viral uh, uh, titers were, you know, at some point the inflammation can become cell autonomous and not driven by uh, the virus. So maybe that group of patients could have benefited uh, from uh, a strongly reduced uh, inflammatory-induced tissue damage. But I will caution everyone, including our group here, and say, well, you know, we can talk to our Cotsford colleagues and say, well, please, you know, share the data with all of us. We need to look really at the details. I'm hoping that also they have biological correlate because this will help us understand uh, why, you know, specific groups, you know, have responded so well. So a fascinating question out of the... Um out of the, from the audience. In a large number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients, there is extensive lymphopenia, yet there is evidence of pro-inflammatory cytokine storm for uh, everyone who, anyone who didn't get those terms, uh, they had low white blood cells, yet their immune system was all amped up. How do you explain this conundrum? Why is, why, how can you, how can you, have your immune system turned down and up at the same time is what this viewer is asking. Yeah, Matt, maybe I can comment. We, we've spent a, a bit of time looking at this issue of lymphopenia and um, it's actually quite interesting in this disease and, and, and maybe a, a hint different than what you see in other settings of lymphopenia. Um, in other settings of lymphopenia, you, you see really loss of all types of lymphocytes. And you do see a reduction in all lymphocytes here in these patients, but it's actually preferential for CD8 T cells. The impact on CD8 T cells is more severe than on CD4 T cells, or certainly the B cell numbers are normal, um, are mostly normal in these patients. And so the selectivity uh, is something that we see occasionally in other very severe human viral infections uh, like Ebola. Um, and so there may be something that allows you to, um, to limit the CD8 T cells, which are of course most important for viral immunity, yet preserve CD4 T cells, which can drive hyperinflammation very easily, but because they can't recognize all virally infected cells, 
can drive inflammation without being as effective as at controlling the infection. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the lymphocytes that we count in the peripheral blood are only part of the story and that many of the lymphocytes have ended up in the lungs or in other tissues where they're actually elaborating this sort of cytokine inflammation. Now the autopsy series that have been published, uh, and there's actually a fairly extensive amount of data now in the literature, um, do show that there are lymphocytes, T cells in the lungs, but it's certainly not a massive accumulation of T cells like you see in some other settings. So that could, could contribute somewhat, um, but we think part of it may be an imbalance that the lymphopenia being measured clinically may be disproportionately one type of lymphocyte, leaving other lymphocytes present capable of actually driving inflammation. And as Carl alluded to in the CAR T cell example, um, the T cells can act as a simple amplifying switch, driving cytokines to be produced from other immune cells. And in that kind of model, you would need a relatively small number of T cells to actually cause the macrophages or the myeloid cells to be the real culprit in driving some of the cytokines. Now, all of this is predicated on, you know, how much cytokines really, or how much inflammation is really there in all these patients. And, and as Mary important now, and we've talked about, there's a wide range of that inflammatory um, syndrome in these patients. Okay, I've got another, another um, head scratcher from the audience. Um, does COVID-19 affect patients differently depending on the type of cancer they have? And I think this is almost the same question. What is known now regarding the adverse impact of COVID on the immune system and its ability to continue to fight cancer? Does it matter? Do we know anything about how COVID interacts with cancer yet? Or is it just too early? John's shaking his head like it's just too early and Miriam's shaking her head like it's just doing, she's nodding. Carl's saying it's too early. Okay, well, it's a really fascinating question. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear, um, you know, we're going to be wrapping up, uh, pretty quickly. This has gone pretty fast, but I'd love to hear from each of you. We've, we've kind of gone fairly deep into this topic of how we've, all we've learned from how all the things we've learned from the immune system, um, about the immune system from studying how it interacts with cancer or helping COVID-19. What would the big, give us all each a each of you a big takeaway from this. What do you what do you want the the audience to? I'd say go home remembering, but I guess we're all probably home watching this. Um, but what would you like the audience to uh, to remember here? And then if we have time, I have one more thing I want to ask all of you about. John, you go first. All right. So um, I, I think the the one thing that I'd like people to take home and remember is that uh, we can and should be measuring the immune system as part of our clinical care. And now that sort of belittles a lot of uh, clinicians who do actually look at the immune system and autoimmunity and other things. But I think what I'm trying to say is that we can measure the immune system with an unprecedented level of, um, of specificity and detail driven a lot by our uh, cancer immunotherapy field. And we can put that into practice to design therapies that are more uh, finely tuned to a patient's clinical presentation type. And so I think integrating the ability to use information about the overall immune health of a patient to tailor treatments is really uh, what a lot of this has taught us and that might be beneficial in diseases like COVID-19. Carl, what about you? Give us a takeaway. Yeah, I think, um, you know, cancer has been from the beginning one of probably the proving ground for translational medicine where things are rapidly taken from you know, basic discoveries and tested right on patients because there, there really was no alternative, just like we have people piling up in ICU with this pandemic. So it, it, it forced people between basic bench science to, to, to work into clinical trials. And I think where we'll see the silver lining in oncology is because oncology now is all about the host immune system reacting to the tumor and the, there's technologies being developed at breakneck speed to study the host immune system in cancer patients. And that is now what is being applied that those technologies can be applied, I think, to the benefit of understanding now this host immune response in, in a pandemic. So we're seeing real technology transfer there and that 
ability, you know, um, that's been installed because of the infrastructure for cancer immuno-oncology is really going to benefit, I think, viral pandemics. And, and it's going to cause this interchange we heard Miriam talking about. Miriam? Well, I want to emphasize that, you know, that the immune system, in fact, has uh, enabled us to survive as a species, right? The immune system protected us from viral infection, extreme weather. And you can see here that we can survive it only if we can fight, if we have an immune response that can fight this viral infection. So I want to say that the real threat for humanity and not other human species are really these pandemics or, you know, climate change. And it's important to reflect on that, you know, as a society, right? How much we want to fund science. And then I want to talk about immunology specifically, you know, it still remain, I think the immune system uh, really an intact source of therapeutic targets. There is so much we can discover still. It is really the beginning of a revolution where you know, we can really learn from it and develop novel therapy. We need more funding for uh, uh, our understanding of the immune system. We need also to measure it. I totally agree with John. We need to measure it uh, 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 much more potently you know, in the clinic. We know so little, you know, so the clinical laboratory uh, 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 you know, uh, tests uh, are really rarely focused on really understanding the complexity of uh, our immune system. And yet uh, it is fundamental, I think, for uh, health and, and homeostasis and repair and uh, being able to resist uh, this type of threat. So, so we need to understand, we need to invest in our understanding of the immune system and we need to harness it. And, and I'm certain that we will get, it, it will lead to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, an increase of this, this immunotherapy revolution, more drugs really harnessing the power of this incredible system that has been shaped by uh, right millennium of evolution, shaped to resist. So there is so much we can learn from. So I wanted to ask you all as a closing, how this pandemic is affecting your labs and your fields and your hospitals. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done on COVID-19, but the rest, everything else has been shut down and that goes for science too. So I'm just curious how, um, how your work is holding up and how you see the field holding up. Um, John, you want to start there? Yeah, I was afraid you were going to ask me first. Um, I, I, you know, this is a, a really, really important question and while COVID-19 science has moved forward and I think will benefit a lot of other areas of science as, as we all kind of alluded to here, a lot of other things have ground to a halt. And it was possible to continue some aspects of data analysis over the last few months, but clinical trials uh, have, you know, really, really been shut down. And, and, you know, while a few things continued through the pandemic, uh, others have been very, very difficult to move forward. Um, a lot of the really key basic science that is the, the jet fuel in the engine of what we're talking about for COVID-19 research, for cancer immunotherapy, a lot of that basic discovery work has essentially stopped. And you say labs reopen tomorrow, we can't restart on a dime. It's going to take a long time to rebuild what we've lost over the last few months. And that's really critical. Um, so I, I think there's been a major, major impact on the scientific enterprise of the entire country. Um, and we're just talking about the experiments that are important, not to mention the people, the career paths, the delays in getting people permanent jobs and, and the training and the people we're going to lose from the field. I think one of the things that, that this pandemic has, I, I hope, taught all of us is that science really matters. We're going to get out of this mess because of science, data-driven science that points to answers and experimentally testing those uh, hypotheses, whether it be in the lab or in the clinic. And if we can't do that, or we've lost a generation of people uh, in this pandemic uh, that are the brilliant new scientists, we're all in trouble. So we have to figure out how to return to a really thriving scientific community as quickly as we can. Carl, what are you seeing? I mean, especially well, with all these stop trials. Yeah, so Matt, it's been really ground us to a virtual halt because of, for us to do a trial, we re rely on getting biopsies and follow up of the patient to learn in a, in a phase one trial while something might work or not work. So it's just not that you give them the intervention, in our case themselves. 
you need to be able to get them back to the hospital and get biopsies. And our biopsy core services have, have been shut down. So, so that, um, you know, that's unfortunate, that impact that John mentioned. Um, I would say that um, uh, we are, you know, learning other things that will allow us uh, to benefit in the long run. But, um, and, uh, you know, we, just didn't ethically think it's possible to treat someone on an early stage trial if we, if if they may be incubating, for instance, COVID, and so, so that's caused delay, and you know, for the patients, at a at a broader, you know, that that you know is is a, is a very unfortunate event, but probably one of the other issues is that um, I've learned that we have done a poor job educating the public why we need science. I've spent a lot of my time with ACR and CRI going to Congress and, and you know educating them about basic science. But I think now is our opportunity to tell the public why they need science. They have no idea why you need a vaccine, for instance, or what, and issues like that. So that is maybe the silver lining if we jump onto that and, 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 and spend more time educating the lay public about science and the benefits it could have. Miriam, what do you see? Well, I want to stress that um, this pandemic has dramatically affected mostly parents of young kids and, and our trainees of, of young children because the schools have closed, you know, nanny are not available or they cannot afford to have nannies uh, you know, take care of their kids. So it somehow created two different groups of people. You know, there are some that have been unable to do any research because uh, we redeployed all our efforts to, to COVID, you know, we were so hit and uh, several uh, trainees wanted to participate and couldn't because they was no one to take care of their kids. And we have to pay attention to this very carefully because this is um, going to affect, affect their career, uh, you know, and we need to be thinking of how um, to really protect, you know, these vulnerable people. Uh, there is also, you know, we had a big financial hit, you know, at Sinai because we had indeed stopped all the election, elective surgery, which is a major source of, of um revenue and um, and right now you know there are uh, you know despite the fact that uh, many of us have been working you know the night throughout the pandemic i'm here in my office i didn't leave my office for for for, for 10 weeks uh, uh, we see that many of these people have been so uh, working so hard uh, may not be uh, protected uh, financially so this is very very difficult uh, to see um, right now we are working hard to, make sure that we can protect the most vulnerable one. All right. Well, thank you, um, John Wary, Miriam Murad, and Carl June. This has been really interesting. Um, and I think a great introduction uh, to this idea, um, not just the topic, but this idea of, of the immune system being important across diseases uh, for, for all of us. Um, I'm Matt Herper uh, from STAT and uh, you can go to cancerresearch.org for updates in this and other topics in cancer immunotherapy. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And thanks again uh, to the three of you. Thank you. And I think that wraps it up.